For today, we'd like to welcome Jared Simmons, and we're all anxious to see about the updates of Hobby and Intercontinental Airport. Mr. Simmons. Thank you. Will this presentation be available? Yes. Well, I don't have to break my arm trying to get all You don't have to take all the notes. No, you don't have to take all the notes. I'll give her a copy of the presentation. And, and as I go through my presentation, feel free to stop me because I'm going to cover a lot of different content. And rather than wait to the end, if you want to have more questions about a certain point, uh, and also since we have a small group, feel free to just stop me and say, hey, you know, I have a question about this or that about a particular item. So I'm going to get started. Um, and here's my agenda I'm going to go through. I'm going to give you an outlook of um, the world as we see it at Houston, the Houston Airport System. I'm going to talk about our Intercontinental Airport uh, Capital Improvement Program Plan. Uh, I'm going to talk about some of the improvements we have going on at uh, the airports at Intercontinental and at Hobby. Uh, and I'm going to tell you where we're at in terms of planning right now. Now, generally people, when they think about airport planning, they're thinking about perpetual terminal construction, perpetual runway construction. We're always building something new and bigger. Well, we have improvements in our pipeline, but they aren't new terminals, they aren't new runways. And you might ask, why not? It's because our growth is flat. Aviation growth in general in the United States is very flat right now. Um, this is based on recent trends. <laughs> Uh, also, it's based on our conversations with the airlines about their forecasts. Uh, we meet on a regular basis with Southwest Airlines, with United Airlines, and with all of the other carriers that operate at our airports. And right now, uh, particularly in terms of operations, looking out five or ten years, they're very flat. Part of that has to do with the airlines have got smarter in how to operate. They don't op operate with excess capacity. Um, it used, it used to be when you flew, you would have an empty seat next to you. Now you never have an empty seat next to you because they've got smart. Um, they've canceled flights, um, they drop flights that aren't full, um, and they tend to overbook on a more regular basis. Because if you're operating an airline, if an air, aircraft departs with an empty seat, that's revenue you can never recoup. And because the, the air, US air carriers have lost tens of billions of dollars in the last few years, They've got smart, and they, they're trying not to lose any more revenue. Now, for our, our fiscal year, which ended uh, June 30th of, of this year, our 2012 fiscal year, which ended June 30th of this year, um, you can see our passenger traffic was only up slightly, about 1%, a little bit over 1%. Our overall operations were down, and I'll explain that a little bit in a minute, why our passengers are up and our operations are down. And our cargo is up a little bit. That's one slightly bright spot we have. Um, because of the energy sector, we're carrying a lot more um, oil components, um, energy drilling components around the world. So our cargo is, is one of our bright spots. But, but as I mentioned, we expect our traffic overall to remain flat for the next few years. Uh, most growth will be attained through upgaging. And what upgaging is, that's, um, for example, recently we got the Airbus 380. Uh, Lufthansa went from a 747, which had about 380 seats, to the Airbus, 3, Airbus 380, which has 526 seats. It costs Lufthansa the same amount of money to operate both aircraft, but they gain almost 200 more seats on the Airbus 380. And it, but actually, the 380 burns a little bit less fuel than the 747, so they save some money in, in that part. So that's what the carriers are doing. And on the opposite end of there, what they're doing, they're going from the 50-seat regional jets to 70-seat regional jets or they're going from 737-700s, which have about 140 seats, to 737-900s, which have about 180 seats. So, and, and both of them are very similar in cost to operate. So that's what the carriers are doing. So our operations may stay flat, but we still have slight growth through upgaging. Also, um, another bright spot for us is we, we do expect to receive some new international service and in carriers. Um, we've, there's already been an announcement that Turkish Airlines will be um, starting service at Intercontinental Airport in April of next year. And um, many people locally don't know about Turkish, but Turkish actually was rated for the last two years as the best, best airline in Europe. Um, they have a very high level of service and they serve most of the other um, Star Alliance and United Airlines is part of Star Alliance hubs in the United States. They serve Los Angeles, Chicago, Washington, Newark, all of their other hubs. And they have a very high level of service. Um, we also expect to receive um, a new Asian carrier in the next year or two. Um, 
we, uh, and we're also talking to some new Latin American carriers. Um, we always have constantly have ongoing conversations about with carriers who are interested in starting service here um, to try to help them work out a deal um, that will be profitable for them. Now, because of this world, this vision, this outlook that we're looking at, um, we have a set of goals in the Houston Airport system that we, um, we um, try to abide by. The first is to build a high performance organization. We've been shrinking our staff over the last couple years, but many people we have on our staff have become, have um, taken on more responsibility and becoming more efficient. Um, we're trying to utilize our people much more efficiently and we also have them in a lot more training so they have additional skill sets. Um, I just talked about international. One thing we're trying to do is go global. Global is where the growth is. Um, domestic traffic is flat and based on my conversation with our carriers, it will be flat for the foreseeable future. But international is where the dollars are at. That's why many carriers are, are trying to start new, new service to Asia and also Latin America. Um, our recent, um, our recent um, conversations, as you saw at City Hall with, South, with um, United Airlines and Southwest Airlines, one reason United fought so hard against Southwest starting service in Latin America is because United makes four times more per passenger on its Latin American service than it does on its European service per passenger. Their yield is what it's called. And so it's a profitable sector right now. Latin America is growing rapidly, faster at a faster rate than Asia is currently. So that's why a lot of the airlines are trying to add additional service to Latin America, um, particularly deep South America, so places like Brazil are growing rapidly. And then fund the future. One thing we haven't done, um, the Houston Airport system, we haven't done a good job of historically is maintain our infrastructure. Intercontinental in particular is 43 years old right now. And we have a lot of infrastructure replacement that is needed at the airport. Sanitary lines, electrical systems, um, a lot of our systems are original, and they've been operating for 40 years, and, and some of them are in bad shape. So when we say fund the future, we, we are saying we need to replace our infrastructure and our facilities or update them. That's when we say fund the future. And also when we say fund the future, we want to spend our money very wisely, uh, the money we do have. Yes, sir. Either keeping the passenger, the landing fees level or declining, is that one of the goals too, or is there a plan? Landing fees won't change. They, they, we're not planning to change landing fees. Um, we're looking at raising our passenger facility charge, which is the, well, in Houston is $3. Every other city in the United States is four fifty. every other large city. That is, a, per my boss, that's a big mistake Houston did over the last 20 years since passenger facility charges have been in effect. Um, and I'm going to show in a little while. Um, if you go to Atlanta, you go to Denver, you go to Los Angeles, they all have new terminals that are under construction. We can't afford it because we did not raise our passenger facility charge. We only started charging a passenger facility charge in 2008. Other cities started in the 90s. And that's $30 million per year based on our traffic we lost every year that could have gone to build new facilities or fix our existing facilities. Um, so you go to Atlanta, Atlanta just opened a $1.4 billion terminal. LAX will be opening in a couple months of $2.8 billion new international terminal. I can go on and on. Um, we can't do that here. We don't have the funds. And part of that was because... Um, was that Continental? Yeah, yeah. We, 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 we let the airlines drive our, our, our growth or our facilities. And airlines do what's good for airlines. And I don't blame Continental. Continental, in, as in all other airlines, they are fis they're, they're aiming on their fiscal year. They have to make profits at the end of the year. We have to build facilities for 20 or 30, 40 years. But their goal is that if they cannot spend money and, if, and improve their profits for their shareholders, that's a good thing for them. And I understand that. But for an airport, that's not always a good thing when you're building infrastructure. Um, that's one reason why some of our infrastructure has been neglected. <laughs> Um, because it was a historic attitude, don't fix it until it breaks. Well, now we have a lot of things break in after 40 years. I, I don't think anybody would argue with maintenance, but I think there's been a little gold plating at some of these other airports. I mean, so, and you're right. In some cases, it has been. But the other thing about those airports, those airports don't have to spend. <laughs> we'll end up spending hundreds of millions of dollars, if not a billion dollars, on anyway, and still not have as good a facility as they have. Where they were proactive, they said, in a lot of cases, let's fix it. 
For example, I worked at Detroit about 12 or 13 years ago. Detroit was the worst airport in the United States. I mean, if you guys have flown out of Terminal B here, which is our worst terminal, it made Terminal B look good. Um, but they reached a point where they could have taken a road that, that HS has taken uh, inside, decided to kind of piecemeal, let's fix a little thing, a few things here, a few things there. But they did the math and they said, well, well, let's bite the bullet and spend the money and replace the facilities. They turned on all the terminals, all their parking facilities. They have brand new facilities all around. Now they're the best, one of the best airports in the United States in terms of facilities. They don't have to do much for the next 30 or 40 years. Except for, and, and these facilities have been designed to be more main, to be easier to maintain, uh, unlike some of our facilities. So it was the decision that was made. You know, yeah, some of them you're right. Some of them did gold plate, but you gotta, you can't nurse things along for so long without spending a substantial amount of money. Um, and in addition, we, we deal with another problem in that, and I'm going to show Terminal D in a little while, some of our facilities, and this was due to airlines, were built cheap. They were value engineered to the hilt. Terminal D, which I'll talk about, was built in 1990. When, our, when people come here, including my boss when he came here, he thought the terminal had been built in the 60s or 70s. It's so poorly built and has so many problems. Um, and it was because it was, it was designed after the oil bus in the late 80s, and at the time, Continental and the um, administrations at the time in City Hall, they cut, 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 but now we're paying for all of it later. Sanitary systems are failing, electrical systems are failing. It's a new terminal by terminal standards. There's another terminal, I, one of the first places I worked was um, in the uh, International Terminal at Chicago here, which was open a couple years after that. You go in that terminal now, it looks like it was built yesterday, but it was built to higher standards. Um, so now we're about to spend several hundred million dollars on a terminal that was built in 1990 to fix it because it's falling apart. So that's a catch-22. You know, you gotta, gotta balance. You don't want to go play too much, but you don't want to build too cheap. You're gonna pay for it later. And we're paying for a lot of things right now, or will over the next few years. And we're not gonna have, and we still will spend a lot of money and not have the level of facilities that we can go down the list. San Francisco, LA, um, Detroit, Atlanta, our list of top 10 competitors have, our, st our facilities will still be subpar compared to some of their facilities. It's just a fact. We don't have the money. Now, talking about our infrastructure and our improvements, this is our top projects on our capital improvement list for fiscal year 13, which started in July. As you can see, most of these are just basic improvements, Recre reconstruction taxiways. Um, a signage, if you drive into our airport, our signs are in horrible condition. This is a top priority for, for the mayor and city hall and for United. The signs haven't been replaced in 40 years, but it costs a lot of money to replace these signs. Um, the, the joints, uh, our tunnel, the train tunnel is leaking. The underground train tunnel intercontinental is leaking and has cracks. That's a big project. We're right now, we're, we're, there's a, um, I think it's on the street now, I don't know what stage it is, or it's about to go on the street, a study too figure out how to fix that problem. Sanitary lines and storm line systems, lift stations, all unglamorous stuff has to be fixed. Um, taxiway and road bridges, we're, we're um, doing um, some repairs on some of those. Pavement, the restrooms, our restrooms are horrible, some of them, in <laughs> some of the terminals. We're spending money on that and we're gonna be spending a lot more money on them. Um, I, I wish I would have brought it. I don't have my presentation. You, you compare some of our restrooms in our terminals. Not E. E is brand new, so E is a different case. But compare our other terminals to other term, our terminals in our competitor airports, it's day and night. It's third world country compared to other airports. Um, operations center. Our operations center, which is the place where we control emergencies, right now it's run out of an old conference room with basically folding tables, conference room tables. Whereas you go to Los Angeles and LA and Chicago, they have state-of-the-art systems, 911 type systems, you know, with the flat screens all whole nine yards. So if there's a hurricane, you know, we're gonna be scrambling to, you know, to have facilities that, that, that are as useful as our competitors. Um, roads, radio, radio, some of these are mandated. Um, one thing, because of hurricanes and also because of 911, we have to get all the radios on the same frequency as the police and fire, so we just have to spend money on that. Um, and our electrical system, um, our electrical vault in A hasn't been touched in, eight, in more than 30 years. We have to completely replace it. And this is another case of 
poor design and lack of forethought, the vault for A is in a sub-basement. It's sealed. So we, to get, we, can't get, we can't get the old transformers and switch gears out, and we can't get new ones in because it wasn't designed to be replaced. So we're going to have to abandon them in place and build a new building next to the terminal for the new transformers and switch gears. That's the lack of planning and foresight. Now, I'm going to talk about some of the projects, the big projects we have going on. Uh, terminal B, and I mentioned Terminal B, um, which is um, one of our worst case terminals. Um, United has a new qu uh, a quarter billion dollar program that's underway to replace, um, um, we're starting with phase one, which is replacement of the south portion of this terminal. And um, it will add new gates for regional jet aircraft, regional aircraft, the 50 seat aircraft that you quite often fly out of here. Right now, this is um, how Terminal B was laid out with the, we call them the banjos, four banjos, uh, two in the north, two in the south. Right now, those banjos weren't designed to accommodate as many passengers as they currently accommodate. When this terminal was built, and this is one of the original terminals, when it was built in the 60s, you only had a couple, usually narrow body aircraft operating out of each of those banjos. Now we have up to, in some cases, up to a dozen aircraft operating out of those banjo, banjos. So the restrooms are undersized and there's not enough concessions in each of those banjos. So what we're going to do is we're going to build a new extension onto the terminal, which is under construction now. If you drive out to Intercontinental, the still is up um, and, and it's going up every day. And this will be con completed um, end, of, end of next year, I believe. And here's a rendering of the interior of the new facility. It will look a lot like Terminal E, the high glass, soaring ceilings, uh, better concessions, you see Starbucks. Um, it'll be a much better experience than a close, than a close claustrophobic facilities we have now in B. Now Terminal D, um, on August 1st, we had the Airbus 380s begin service here at Intercontinental Airport. And um, that drove a lot us to speed up some interim improvements at the airport, um, at Terminal D in particular. The first of these, we had to get a new bridge that could reach the upper level of the Airbus 380. But also, as I mentioned, there's problems in Terminal D. The 380 has a greater demand on systems in the building than other aircraft do. Um, the big yellow hoses you see on the bottom of the bridge, that's preconditioned air. That's how we pump air-conditioned air in the aircraft when it's on the ground, where our cur the systems we had before couldn't properly cool the aircraft. They couldn't even cool small aircraft. Um, and so we had to upgrade that system, and we're upgrading the system throughout Terminal D to properly cool all the aircraft to operate there. In addition, the Airbus 380 has four power connections. When aircraft land, you see guys plug in a big cable to the aircraft. That's to provide power so the aircraft can shut off its engine when it's on the ground. Well, the 380 has four plugs because it has it's such a large aircraft. It's 526 seats. Each seat has its own TV, plus there's a lot more systems on the aircraft. So it, it has a higher power, power requirement. Well, we had to upgrade the building, the electrical system in the building, just to power that aircraft. So to, uh, just to upgrade, to accommodate the 380 were about $5 million with, for the bridge, for the power upgrades, and for the preconditioned air upgrades. Um, but that's the first of, upgrade, first of interim upgrades, as we're calling it, that we're doing in Terminal D. But also, we, we, we decided to do some other interior upgrades to the building. Um, this is a rendering of, it won't look exactly like this, we've changed some things, um, so of uh, upgrades that will happen over the next six months in the terminal. Um, and we're doing this because, yeah, let's see, let me get to my rope. Because our competitor, I mentioned our competitor airports. This is the, this is the uh, terminal at, at Atlanta Airport, the International Terminal, that just opened about a month ago, about two months ago, actually. This is our Terminal D. You know, and uh, one question we have, and this is a, actually a good picture, we have green carpet on the wall, and our, one of our questions we have is, who decided to do green carpet on the wall in 1990? So um, this is the carpet. The carpet hasn't been replaced since 1990 when it was built. And that shows some of the worn places in the carpet. And the terrazzo is cracking all over. So we are doing some, so what we realized is that beyond the interim improvements of, for the 380 and the power for the aircraft, and we're putting down some interim carpet in, we need to do some more major improvements in Terminal D. 
Uh, also, our restrooms are undersized there. For example, the 380 gate, we have the restroom in, that serves the 380 with 526 people. Each restroom only has about four stalls. The men and the women's restroom, well, the men's has a couple urinals and two stalls. The women's restroom only has four stalls for 526 people. So what, we, what we, what's now underway right now and what we're working on is a, a larger scale project for Terminal D. And um, planning is underway on that um, project and we'll, um, we're, we're scheduled to complete the first quarter of, of 2013. And what that project will do is add additional wide body gates. Right now, if a carrier came to us and wanted to have service, um, an international carrier and wanted to have service at Intercontinental between noon and 6 p.m., we would have to say no, we have no gates. We have no gates to accommodate them. Um, so we want to get some additional wide body gates. We desperately need new and refurbished and enlarged restrooms. That's a critical need we have in Terminal D. Um, more concessions, more restaurants, more duty free shops. Um, if, you, if you fly first class on the Airbus 380 flight that goes to Frankfurt, Germany, uh, and I always ask this question, can anybody guess how much a seat, a first class seat is on that aircraft? Yeah. Seven thousand. Anyone? Anybody else? Seventeen thousand dollars. Business class is nine thousand dollars. And guess what? Those seats are full almost every day. Lufthansa is happy, laughing all the way to the bank. They have ninety on the three eighty. They have one hundred and seven. They have eight, eight first class seats and they have 98 business class seats and they're full almost every day. The airlines love this market because of, mainly because of the energy sector. You know, if you're working on a billion dollar project in the North Sea, what's $20,000? And so the airlines love Houston because they fill their premium seats every single day. And, but one complaint they have is these people are spending all this money on these seats you know, 17,000, it's also 16,000 go to Dubai on Emirates. The people, there's nothing to buy. If you've ever been at the airports on the opposite end of these flights, if you've ever been to Dubai or Singapore or other places, our airport's a dump. There's nothing to buy. And so we, we're losing money. The carriers tell us we're losing money because we don't have proper stores, enough concessions, enough duty free. Um, because particularly people from those other countries, they come to shop. Even if they're here on business, they're shopping. They want to buy because our products tend to be cheaper than their product, than, than the cost they spend in, in, in their home countries. So they come, they're the people, if you ever go through duty free stores around the world, you ever wonder who buys the, the $500 bottle, gold plated bottle of Jack Daniels or the you know, $2,000 Rolex? Is these people do, they do. We have nothing like that. We, even though we don't even need anything like that, but we don't even have the perfume and the other cheaper items for them to buy. So that's a lot of money we lose every day. Um, so one thing we want to do is add a lot more concessions, more stores. For example, if you go to our ticket hall for Terminal D. Is it the 380s that are going to be here only for a few more months? And then Continental's not going to fly them out of here anymore? Continental doesn't have 380s. Or United? United doesn't have 380s. Yeah. Okay. No. Something. Only one carrier is operating 380s out of here. That's, yeah. that's Lufthansa. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. United's getting 787s, but they're all based here, and they will be based here for the foreseeable future. Uh, the first one arrives in a few days, and um, Houston is the base for the, the it will be the, the headquarter, the maintenance base for all of the 787s. Um, I, off the top of my head, I think they're going to start they're going to do run domestic service for a few months to test them. And then they start, I think, Amsterdam. And then it's Lagos. Lagos is going to be Nigeria, which they already operate out of here, is going to be one of the first permanent routes. Lagos is another oral right route that they make a lot of money on every day. Um, but that's a, the seven eights will come in soon. Yeah. But, um, but for example, I was talking, going back to Terminal D, if you ever um, are in a ticket hall for Terminal D, you see people arrive there in the morning from connecting flights. They go there not knowing there's nothing to eat there. There's only a bar there. And so you have families with kids who are sitting there. There's no food. There's no, no donuts, no nothing. And so that's money we lose, no Starbucks. And so we're trying to um, improve our concession program to, um, to um, uh, help them out in and get re additional revenue. And one of the big demands for the airlines are lounges. 
Um, if you're paying $18,000 for a ticket, you want a nice, quiet place with great food to enjoy as part of your, your experience on that flight. Um, Emirates has come to us and they've requested a um, 10,000 square foot lounge with kitchens and all kind of other amenities in it. We don't have the space to provide it. They're willing to pay for it, we just don't have a space in a terminal. Um, and, and that is a key part of their experience. So our, ter our lounges we have today are kind of cobbled together and are not on par with what these airlines expect at an airport. And believe me, I hear from them every day. They complain to us about our facilities. And so that's one reason we're starting this, this modernization program. What we're going to do, and one of the ideas is we're going to build a new pier onto Terminal D. And this is one of the early conceptual drawings. And um, it, this is evolving you know, as, as, as I speak. People are working on this right now. Our terminal planners are working on this right now. And in the end, it, this is a rendering. It will look something like this. It won't look exactly like this. This was an early rendering, but it, this is a kind of a concept of what it will look in the end. Now, we always have other projects going on at the terminal, at the at Intercontinental, all the time. But here's a couple of our key projects. One is Terminal A. Uh, we control the Houston Airport system only controls two of the terminals: terminal, terminals A and terminals D. United Airlines controls B, C, and E. E is a new terminal. E was only built a few years ago, so it's just in great shape right now. C just underwent a major renovation, so it's in very good shape right now. United is working, along with us, are working on Terminal B. It, the upgrade for B is underway. The next in line will be A. Um, well, actually, D will probably come before A, but A we're got, we want to improve our ticket hall, our restrooms there, which are in poor condition, we want to upgrade. And also our security checkpoints, we want to make them work a bit better. I mentioned roadway signage earlier. Uh, we also want to add additional economy parking, our, our, we call it Echo Park. Our main economy lot has been extremely successful um, since it was rebranded and re redone as Echo Park uh, about a year and a half ago. And um, it often fills up quite often during the summer months. And so we want to build a new Echo Park along Will Clayton uh, in the area that was formerly our, our rental car area before we built our consolidated rental car facility. Also, we're talking to the hotel operator who operates the Marriott at the airport about doing some major renovations of that facility. Right now, that facility is very dated. Um, we've been talking to them, and, and actually, I think my boss and some others went to look at a hotel, similar hotel near Chicago O'Hare. They recently renovated, and it was amazing the job they did on it. It was a similarly aged hotel, but they did um, tens of millions of dollars of renovation on it, and it looks like it was built yesterday. And so that's what we're looking to do with, with our current Airport Marriott Hotel. Now, let's talk a little bit about Hobby and Ellington and some of the things we have going on there. Uh, or we'll have going on there. Our control tower um, is um, almost 60 years old. And uh, it was damaged during the um, Hurricane Ike. And if you go by there, there's supports actually to hold it up right now. So we have a program in a pipeline to replace it. Um, at Hobby Airport, our airport maintenance complex, airport service complex, which is, oh, sorry, the extra old misspelling. Um, our airport maintenance complex is 60 or maybe 70 years old. We don't quite know how old it is. It leaks. It's in very poor condition. Um, we're in the process of, of planning a replacement for it. Um, at Ellington, we are working on a, a, a offices for customs agents for Ellington to meet private jets arriving there. Um, Ellington has been getting more and more traffic from uh, Latin America, people with private jets. And so what we wanna, they want to have is a couple of customs agents there to meet those arriving aircraft. Um, and then we have a lot of infrastructure things. We have some road improvements, and we have power lines that are, uh, need to be lowered underground to make way for future development. Uh, hobby, hobby Cargo Building, we're talking to Southwest about moving their cargo building to a new location and building a new building. That cargo building is about 50 or 60 years old. Uh, and then Hobby FIS, which I'll talk about in a minute, um, the international facility for Hobby. And also a parking garage. Um, we are very parking constrained at Hobby, particularly during holiday seasons. So I'm going to talk a little bit more, more about that in a minute. 
this is um, a rendering of Hobby International. Um, this is probably our most highest profile project we have going on right now because of the fight between Southwestern United. Um, we are in planning for this project. Uh, I meet with um, Southwest folks every week. We have weekly meetings with them. And um, it's, it's been very productive. Um, it's a learning experience even for Southwest because they have never done international service. So they're learning a lot of things about Customs and Border Patrol um, rules and regulations and, and how those operations happen. Um, and um, so it's been, it's been very, very productive. Um, but also we're looking for the future. We, we don't just want to plan for now, we want to plan for the long term. So this was one of the early renderings, but what we're, our concepts now, which I can't show to you right now, but it's very close to this. Um, this would be the rival, the rival level of the, um, of the terminal, and you would arrive in one of these gates, you would take an escalator or elevator down to this lower level here. These would be the lanes for immigration, pass through immigration, pick up your bag, and then go through what we call secondary check where they decide if they want to search your bag or not when you come out of customs. Uh, and then you take an escalator up to the next level, which is where you would um, come back up into the main ticket hall. As part of this, we also plan to redo the security checkpoint, which is a problem area at Hobby Airport. The lines there are very, very long. Um, we plan to add up to 14 new lanes and reorientate them um, so we have better flow. Um, and then we would have a new, new hall rooms, new waiting rooms for the, the uh, five gates here. So that's moving along very well. Yes, sir? Those people can connect without going through security again? You have to, when you come out of custom, you have to go through, back through security by federal law. When you yeah, so after they come out of customs, they have to go? By federal law, if you're on a connect and flight. Wow. Yeah. At Intercontinental, you come up out of security, and then you go back through a, a security checkpoint. You have to do that by federal law. We also are talking to CBP, and I'm going out to Washington in a couple of weeks, on some possible new methods for customs um, that are being tested around North America. Uh, one thing in Vancouver, they have a concept where they're, um, instead of you going to do a booth with, with immigration agents, you go through a self-service kiosk. You punch in your own, if you swipe your passport, you punch in your own information, and then it'll print out a, a card. And during the, the couple of minutes it takes you to walk from the kiosk to the to, to where you exit past the customs agent, it does a background check on you. So by the time you get there, the customs agent knows if he needs to do interview you more or do more checks on you. That's one thing we're we're, we're working with CBP on. Another thing we're working with CP, CBP on is instead of having the the booths here we might have move the booths up here and just have you come off the plane, pick up your bags, and then go through an agent, then the agent decides whether to do more checks with you or to wave you out. And what that does, it allows us to build a smaller facility. So we're working with CBP on some new ideas that they have and new techniques we have to try to make this facility more efficient. We also will be t testing some of these te techniques soon at Intercontinental Airport also to try to reduce lines. Well, uh Customs operations at Intercontinental be uh, less efficient to uh, no, take on the Southwest. No, we we've, we've already met with CBP and they they put in their budget for fiscal year 15 a, a request for additional agents. Now that's up to Congress to fund it, that, but but they believe it will be funded. But that's one reason we're looking at new techniques to reduce the number of agents. Right now, based on our calculations with CBP, we will require about 20 agents to man the facility at Hobby. But with some of these new techniques, it might reduce the number of agents that they require. So that's one reason they're very eager, because not only are, do we have lines at Intercontinental, every other airport in the United States has lines. It's just the degree of lines. Miami is one of the worst, but everybody has lines. And so CBP's budget is capped by Congress, you know, generally. And so what they do, they tend to shuffle agents around from smaller airports to the big cities. Um, and that's why they're looking for new techniques to have people do more themselves. And this will be optional. If you, if, if for some people you might have seniors who may not want to do that themselves, they'll still always have customs agents in a traditional lane, but for the frequent flyers, if they don't want to deal with the agent, they just want to swipe and exit, they can do that. Actually, I use it, um, some of the t new techniques we have at Intercontinental is global entry. 
I use that when I come back in the country. It's, I used it for the first time, um, when was it, in July, when I came back from a conference. It just, it took me, I didn't have checked bags, it took me three minutes to clear customs, put my passport on the scanner, punch in and answer a couple questions, walked out, showed, showed the agent my slip, he looked at me, he was like, wave me out. It's very, very good, yeah, very efficient. He knew you were the deputy. <laughs> no, he didn't. He didn't. I didn't have my ID badge on. No, actually, Houston actually has the largest um, level of participation of global entry in the United States. And what they've been doing locally is they've been going to some of the, uh, like uh, BP and some of the companies, Halliburton, some of the companies where, where people travel frequently internationally. And they've been, um, and the companies actually have been encouraging enrollment in this program. So, two questions. Uh, one is, even if the airport has money and would like to pay for extra customs agents or immigration, you guys can't. We can't. There's we a can't. Firewall it's a firewall. Yeah, can't. we can't pay for more. No, no. That that's based on current, and that's why we met about a month ago. We we had our, our big meeting with all the big wigs from CBP, from the region, and they are actually they're very excited about this program too, about Hobby International too. But they have to put it in their budget request to Congress for more, more uh, agents. And do we have to get like a congressman to go to bat for that? Well, we like, do. We, we always there? do. We always do. Okay. Even for Intercontinental, we regularly, our, our congressional delegation regularly goes to CBP and requests more agents. But you have the congressional delegations from New York and LA and Seattle and every place else requesting agents. Um, and a lot of it, and they have formulas and models, and, and it's, it's demand. It's where traffic is at. They try to balance it out as best as they can. Um, but the only thing we do have control over is the, the kiosk, like the global entry kiosk. We've been adding more and more of them to reduce the lines for everybody else. So that's one thing we, uh, you know, I know our folks and also Greater Houston Partnership have aggressively been um, pursuing the, the local corporation to get their folks enrolled. Because the more people we can global entry, the more people we take off the main lines. And then the second question is, the, is that six gates I'm seeing here? There's five gates. The sixth position is a um, corporate position. Right now, there's CBP agents at Hobby right now that clear uh, corporate aircraft. But right now, the way they do it, they are, they are in trucks and they drive all over to the different fixed base operators' locations. It's very inefficient. What we plan on doing with the new facility is have the aircraft taxi over to the facility where the agents are at. So an agent will just walk out, do his check, and go back in the building. It's more efficient for them. So is there a, a if Let's say it goes gangbusters for Southwest and they decide they need more than five gates down the road. Is there a, it's yeah. going to be designed with a long term? We have, expansion? it'll be designed to expand. Um, we have different concepts, but between 10 and 11 gates is where what the, can be expanded to. Great. Yes, ma'am. You mentioned currently uh, CBP goes to the aircraft and they crash when they come back to play. Yes. Sometimes they do. You're right. Right. They have. They do have a location on the south side near where they're based at. Some cases they do drive out. Um, they they're doing that at Ellington now because there's nobody. Well, probably because there's no facility at Ellington, so they do drive out. But you're right. Quite often they do just taxi over to the CBP location. But you know, sometimes they do drive over too. So how would it be here exactly? Is this part of? Yeah, they would taxi over to the to that position, and at the north they would taxi over to that position. The CBP agent would come out of the facility. This is where their office is. This is where CBP the, and the other federal agencies, um, DEA, Fish and Wildlife, um, and all of the other fed or federal agencies would be based at. So they would just come out the building, walk over to the aircraft, do the inspection of the aircraft and of the people in the aircraft, and go back in. Then the aircraft would taxi to its hangar. Would there be dedicated people for this? And, uh, no, they use it for the general pool. We, we, um, we are having issues in San Antonio mm -hmm. because they are doing this. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't want to see that same issue here at Hobby. We'll check on it, but they, they have a common pool. It's what they use, just as you're in San Antonio. They usually use a common pool. Right. Yeah. yeah. San Antonio, there's a lot of airplanes moving from San Antonio to Austin because right. CBP is so bad. So I want to see that same problem here. Yeah, yeah. And we'll, we'll, we'll check on that, but we have very little control over that. It's the CBP agents who control that. So. You know, it depends. Okay. Now, also at Hobby, there's a couple other, well, several other projects we have going on. First, I mentioned parking. We're looking to build a new um, parking garage, um, and it's 
we're trying to wind up wind down planning for that now and hope to go to design in the next month or two. Um, the garage will be in the 3,000 vehicle range. Um, and it hope, hopefully will alleviate, alleviate a lot of our parking problems at Hobby. Also, um, as young lady just mentioned, um, our fixed base operators, our corporate operators, uh, all of them, are, virtually all of them at Hobby are doing major upgrades to their facilities, uh, in every single one of them. Um, some of them tell us, some of their facilities are aged, and then some of them are telling us that since we're doing an international project at the terminal, they want to upgrade their facilities. But it's a, it's a lot of competition going on right now between those fixed base operators um, to get the, um, get the corporations, to get the shells, get the Halliburton's, get the British Petroleum's um, to serve their aircraft. So they're all building more Taj Mahal type facilities. Um, some of the plans for some of these facilities are incredible, you know, the marble and granite and everything. But I guess if you're servicing people who have $50 million aircraft, you know, you want that, those top level facilities. And that's another issue they're dealing with. The corporations are getting larger and larger aircraft. The standard aircraft that's now at Hobby is a Gulfstream 5, which is a very large business jet. Uh, and some of the corporations are now using Boeing business jets, which are 737s for their corporate operations. They can't fit into the hangars that the, we have now at Hobby. Some of the hangars were built 50 years ago. They just are too large. The parking garage, where is that going to go? We are, I, I can't say right now because we're, we're in the final stages of location, but we will know probably this week, later this week. But it'll be, it'll be adjacent to the terminal. I like to say adjacent to the terminal. Now, next steps. The next, the, what we have going on planning wise at the airport is, uh, we have a lot. We have three master plans, master plans for each of the airports underway right now. The hobby master plan and Ellington master plans are probably a little bit more than 50% completed. Um, they'll be completed next summer. The intercontinental master plan, and we're still in early stages of it. Um, we just actually got funded for it just a couple months ago to get fully under speed, underway. Uh, I mentioned Hobby International and the new garage. That plan is underway and that planning will be done in January for the terminal itself will be done in January and we will go immediately into design. Um, we actually are scheduled to break ground uh, before the end of 2013. It's a hard date that we, we have to make. And then finally, the uh, Terminal D uh, plan is underway. We intend to complete planning in the first quarter of 2013 and that project will go immediately into design and we hope to break ground and start construction in 2014. Any other questions? Yeah. A number of years ago I saw an IH master plan that, that kind of said long, long term, tear down all the terminals yep. and build something like Atlanta. Yeah. Is that still? It's been thrown in the garbage can. Oh, okay. It, okay. It, it wasn't feasible. It was, um, in today's dollars, it would probably be $20 billion, we, our good guesstimate. It was, uh, you know, and, and when they did it at the time, there was, there was double digit growth, traffic growth at the airport. And I think some folks thought that that growth would continue forever. Um, also, they didn't look at how do you, would you keep the airport operating while you did that? How would you build on top of an active airport? Which, to some degrees, can be done. I mean, Chicago's building new runways over active airport, but it's, you, terminals are a different thing that's very difficult to do. So no, that's kind of out the window, the old master plan. Okay, it, it seemed like a, a horrible bottleneck to have a single place where everybody would be dropping off and picking up for the entire Well, actually, that's our, that's our problem we have here now. We have, can anybody guess how many curve fronts we have at this airport at Intercontinental? How many what? Curve fronts, where you drop off passengers. Eight? 30. 16, the most of any airport on the face of the earth. That's great. You don't get the bottlenecks. People spread out. But it's a, it, that's, it, it partially it is, but it's a mess traffic-wise and a mess wayfinding. For people who haven't been to the airport, they have a difficult time finding where they got to go to. I get, believe me, I answer lots of nasty letters all, every month. It's a mess. Uh, airport, airport planners come here, that, and these planners have worked all over the world, and they say this is the worst they've ever seen. The, the, the ideally, and if you look at airports, the best airports in the world, how they're built, they usually have a single curve front. Actually, Denver is a good model. Denver has three level curve front. It's a single, it's very long, but it's three levels. One level for passenger departures, one level for passenger arrivals, and one level for 
commercial vehicles, for buses, taxi, limos. You come into a single ticket hall, one single ticket hall, you have one big security checkpoint. That's how all the new airports on the face of the earth are built. Hong Kong, Singapore, all airports you hear about the best airports in the world, that's how they're all built. This is a mess. We have nine security checkpoints, which TSA hates us for that. Uh, it's a mess. It, it, it's very costly to operate. We have to, for example, when in nighttime, I'll give you some of the costs we have to pay. At nighttime, when TSA doesn't staff those checkpoints, we have to pay for security guards to man all those nine checkpoints to make sure nobody penetrates those. It's added cost. If we have one security checkpoint, we have one person. It's electrical costs. It's all kind of costs that we spend that other folks don't have to spend. I've read nightmare stories online about Atlanta, though. It's a place where you need to go two hours in a day. Yeah, Atlanta, 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 Atlanta has problems with their security checkpoint. The, the new air. They, it depends on time of day. They sometimes have, have long lines. But Atlanta was the model that most of the new airports in the world were based off of. It was when it opened in 1980, the current terminal. It has flaws. Its ticket hall is only one level. Its um, security checkpoint wasn't big enough. But the general model of it, that's how Denver, Hong Kong, Seoul, Korea, Beijing, every new airport is built in the world that's been built since then has been built off of that. And the, the people flow pretty well through all those models? They flow through those models okay. very, very well. Okay. And it's because you have, like I can say, if you build it big enough. Now, the security checkpoint Atlanta could be, should be built bigger, but they have some issues with building it bigger. Yeah, they probably have T, they have the main one, in a, they have the new one. But they, they've been enlarging and enlarging it over the years. But if you could start from scratch like the like a Hong Kong or some of those airports did, you just build it bigger. You have a gigantic security checkpoint. Um, but the way what they have with the train, to link all the terminals, you can move a lot of people. That's how Atlanta moves 90 million people per year, which is more than twice what we move in Intercontinental. So yeah, they can have lines because they're moving twice the people we move. So our long term is stick with the terminals we got now. We, 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 you just can't, can't, we just can't afford to build no, new ones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're, but what we're trying to do is refine. It's, it's, it's incremental refinement is what we're doing. Yes, ma'am. You talked earlier about the fact that we can't make our renovations because we don't have the money. Are you going to a little bit about Well, well no, I, we are making renovations, but we're more limited in the scale of renovations we can do. Comparison to our competitors? Yeah. Yeah, we can't build a new terminal. Like he was just talking about, a, a, you know, if we build a new terminal. We, we're not going to build a new terminal, but we are going to make major upgrades to all of the terminals. But you're not going to have a new, like Denver, for example. Denver's only built in 1995. They're building a new, brand new, another new terminal. Did they receive more Well, it goes back to what I was saying about the passenger facility charges. Um, every time you buy a ticket here, and we just started charging this in 08. It, there's a $3 um, fee that they put on your ticket um, to pay for facilities. Um, at Intercontinental, based on our traffic, that's $30 million per year we, we could get for, based on our traffic level, 40 million passengers. Um, or it's in plane, so it's only half that. So 20 times that, no, times $3. So that's about $30 million per year. Um, other airports have been collecting that money for 20 years. We haven't. And so it goes into a big slush fund that they used for construction. So that's how they can build a billion dollar terminal. We can. Um, and on top of that, we charge three dollars. They charge four fifty. About ten years ago, they raised the, the fee to four fifty. So you have Los Angeles and Atlanta and Chicago and New York. Every airport, every major airport except for Houston has been charging that. So that's how they have more money to work with. We're limited in the money we have to work with. Is 450 a done deal, or what's the process whether you guys go to 450? We could go to it. We could go to it tomorrow, but we usually get consent of our carriers, and it's been our carriers, not Southwest. They're okay with it. Our other carrier, United, hasn't wanted to do it historically. More so, Continental than United. United is still balking, but Continental was dead set against it. Even though at Newark and Cleveland, they've charged it for years. Yes, sir. Yeah, we're still working on our forecast numbers, and, I, and I, I'll, you missed um, um, what what we are expecting is that, and this is based on some of our conversations with Southwest. 
our traffic will stay relatively flat at all of the airports. Hobby will have some incremental growth because of Hobby International. But what Southwest is planning to do, they're planning to swap out some of their domestic flights for new, uh, for their international flights and also for flights that will connect to the international flights. Um, I'll give you an example. Dallas, you know, Dallas Love Field had the right amendment, has the right amendment in place right now until 2014, which means they can't fly to any places from Dallas Love Field except for to states that touch Texas. That goes away in 2014, so they can fly anywhere. Because of that, some connecting flights that normally would connect in Dallas Love Field now come to Houston. Like, for example, if someone's coming from um, Chicago to Dallas, they can't fly nonstop from Chicago Midway on Southwest to Love Field. So what happens now, they quite often they might connect in Houston to go to Dallas. So what Southwest plans to do in 2014 is when the right amendment goes away, some of those connections will move from Hobby up to Love's Field. But, and, and, but they're gonna fill a gap in with new flights to feed their new international flights and their new international flights. So it'll be a, it'll be a slight increase, but it'll be more of a wash from what they're telling us. It's what their plan is. So it's gonna be some growth. I mean, we're expecting, um, I think in the number where we, where some of our numbers, about 800,000 new international passengers. But because you're shifting some connect, domestic connections to Love Field, it kind of washes out in a way. Is that why, so that you're building a, you know, a new terminal, that's the terminal D, the new international terminal? No, no, D is at Intercontinental. Um, the new, a new, we are building a new international facility at Hobby, yes. Okay, and then the parking garage would be for 3,000 new cars, and that's basically the end new traffic as well? Not just new traffic, we need a garage today, even while international. We, um, last Christmas was horrible, and Thanksgiving was horrible. People put parking in neighborhoods. Uh, we, need, we need parking today, um, even without the international. But with the international, it just, it just elevates the problem. It'll be a new garage built adjacent to the existing garage. I know you can't say where it's going to be. It's going to be adjacent to the airport, but is that land that the new garage is going to take up? Oh, we, we, have, we have two parcels that we're looking at um, for that there's enough room for it. Yeah, um, adjacent to the terminal. Are there any other, going back to your funding, um, are there any other sources of funding that you need besides the PFC? Um, yeah, yeah. Well, for, for, for our airports, we have several funding mechanisms that we use to pay for infrastructure. Um, in our general fund, as we call it, we parking revenue goes, feeds our general fund. Concessions revenue feeds our general fund. Um, we also, um, we get some grants for some, and mostly for airfield work from the, from the FAA for taxiway improvements, um, upgrade runways. Um, but usually most of, all of our, we're in, well, first let me say, we're an enterprise fund, so we don't get tax dollars, direct tax dollars. We generate all of our funds on airport, and they're usually through revenue we generate on airport. And, and from the least charges for our, from our, our carriers. If I don't have any more questions, we need to let you all go so you all can get back to your jobs. We want to thank you for coming. Uh, uh, as we said before, this presentation will be online, uh, video of the presentation. Uh, in a couple of days. So just watch our website and you'll be able to access it for people who didn't spend much time today. But like I said, we will have the next round back in January. We don't know who that will be yet, but we'll let you know. And thank you. Thank you. And if anybody has any other questions, see me afterwards. Thanks.